Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. When I first came into a Alcoholics Anonymous, have I introduced myself? No. My name is Griffin. I'm an alcoholic and I'm from Georgia, South Africa. Oh, dear. And um, my, in, on the 19th of January, I will have 32 years of sobriety. And my home group is Friends in Recovery. Um, okay, now I can go to when I, when I first came. I'm going to be going backwards and forwards a bit here. So please bear with me. When I first came into AA, I used to say the serenity prayer over and over and over again. But I was saying it. I was just saying it in road. I was not, it did not mean anything at all. Um, and I also found that I listened at the meetings, but I wasn't hearing. I wasn't hearing anything. So I didn't actually recover. I did my 90 days in 90, 90 meetings in 90 days, but I was not recovering. I was there. We used to talk about fake it until you make it. And I think now, I think I heard somebody say, um, if you get your body to the meeting, your mind will follow. Well, fake it until you make it was more or less the same sort of thing. And that was what I was doing. So it wasn't, I was, stay, I was, stay, I was at that stage staying, staying, staying sober. Uh, But I will come back to that a little bit later. I read this two days ago. Addiction will end your life. Recovery will change your story. And not only will it change my story of where I am now and how I got here, because my perception of my AA journey has changed and definitely my perception of my life before I came into AA has changed dramatically. So if there's anybody here on the platform who has heard my story before, I was not lying about my story. That was my story at that time. My story now is com- is very, very different. A lot of the reason why my story is so different is because of COVID. Um, I lived in a little town in the bush in the Eastern Cape in South Africa where we had very little reception and there were no meetings. I was seven years sober when I went there and I stayed there for 23 years. And while I was there, I had very, very good go to a rally probably once or maybe twice a year and a convention once a year and that was it. I was a loner, but I wasn't a loner as I should have been a loner. I wasn't in contact with any other loners and um, I was no longer reading literature every day as, um, as part of my daily life, nor was I praying every day as, no, more of my, as, as part of my daily life. Um, somebody said to me the other day, but you lived AA when you were there. And I have heard things about myself that I don't recognize because they are very kind, they're very kind and very nice remarks. And I don't see myself the way, uh, I, I, I just don't see myself that way. I want to go back to um, my early years and, and to COVID. I'm extremely grateful for COVID. I'm not grateful because I had it three times and I've been in quarantine for about seven times. I'm not grateful for that. But what I am grateful for me, this was an absolute godsend. Not only because I didn't have any AA for 23 years and suddenly it was there 24 hours a day, but also because I was able to learn more about myself and about my recovery. And I have recognized things in other people's shares that I had not looked at before and I know my brother I'm hoping my brother won't be offended by this but um, 
my brother's recently joined AA and I have learned a lot from him. And we've been talking about various things about our childhoods and things. And a lot of the things I had started to recognize already before he came onto AA. So when I gave my maiden talk at six months uh, sober, I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I had done no damage to my children and everything was absolutely hunky-dory. But now, almost 32 years later, in the last, I would say, six, three to six months, I have suddenly started remembering things that I think maybe had been, had been too pain, painful. I hear people talk about trauma. I hear people talk about um, parents who shouted and, and parents who did this and parents who did that. And it started like niggling. I, I got these niggles. And I think they were things that I had put away and shut the door. And we re realize we, we read on a daily basis. We do not wish to we do not wish to shut the door on our past. And none of the things that I'm going to talk about now made me an alcoholic, but they definitely had a lot to do with my behavior, both as an alcoholic and in sobriety. And I'm going to go back to listening to people and the trauma that they had. And here was this perfect human being with this wonderful childhood. And we came to South Africa from England when I was seven years old. My brother was four months and my sister was nine. We were taken out of our environment and brought to a completely different environment where there was um, a, lot of, a lot of nasty politics. Um, they spoke in English that my mother, who spoke the Queen's English, really did not understand. <laughs> and she couldn't translate people with a South African accent. She couldn't understand them. And the Cape Tonians have got a much stronger accent than Durban. And so that was difficult because I would not understand what a friend was saying and take it to my mother. And my mother wouldn't understand either. And even though I said it was nothing difficult or trauma in my life, I think that must have been very traumatic. I know that I hated where we lived when we came to South Africa. We lived in a rented house, but it, was, it wasn't our furniture. I don't remember any toys belonging to me in that, in that house. And my brother and my sister and I, we shared one room because my parents had very little money and they had to let out uh, the other two bedrooms, there was a woman with her boy, a son, which I resented terribly because I felt he got far more attention than I did, which is quite correct because he was a boarder. Um, the other room was led to a, a, a lady that I really loved. Her name was Miss Denton and she was fabulous. But my parents bought on HP a pull-out couch, which they slept on in the dining room. So they had to get up very early in the morning and make up the bed so they could serve breakfast on the table in the dining room. We weren't served breakfast on the table in the dining room. And I think that I probably had a lot of resentment to that. I ran away from home a lot of times. Um, and I spoke to my mother about it before she died, poof, what, 60 years later. And I said, you know, you never looked for me. Why did you never come and look for me when I ran away? And my mother said, well, because we knew you always come back. I mean, that's like, to me, that is a terrible attitude. Like, what if I hadn't come back? How long would they have left me outside, hiding? I wasn't, I didn't go very far, but nobody looked for me. And I don't know whether that made me feel unwanted. I don't really understand what the feelings were or are. I, I, I haven't got there yet. But it is disturbing to start thinking about these things. And another thing was... Um, curfew when I was um, out of school really I was working we had a curfew it was 11 o'clock at night and I remember coming home one night and being walked to the door possibly kissed or smooched or whatever I don't even remember that but I remember opening the door and my father hit me we had a very large entrance hall with a passage at the back and I flew right across the entrance hall into the wall on the other side of the passage. I had no idea actually what had 
what had happened. But that big hard smack was because I had come in at 10 past 11. And my father explained to me many months later that they felt that 11 o'clock at night was late enough to have been woken up. So this very happy childhood that I had, I'm now remembering various things about it. I don't know what I've done wrong, but I remember being hit with a stick, that the stick broke. And my father picked up one of the pieces and carried on hitting me. And it was the only time I remember my mother ever intervening. And she said, she just called my father's name enough. That's enough. I was very black and blue and a very unhappy, unhappy person. And my mother, I, I, I had a lot of resentments towards my mother because she did not stand up for me. In many ways, she did not stand up for me at all. And I got into trouble at home. And so I remember these bouts of anger, horrific anger. Um, during the war, when we lived in England, our dining room table was our air raid shelter. And I remember my father taking the tablecloth and throwing everything onto the floor, every single solitary thing onto the floor, because there was a room of dried mustard on the little mustard pot. My mother hadn't taken out the mustard that she'd mixed the day before and cleaned it all up and made you much extreme anger. And these bouts of anger showed themselves on various occasions. When I came into AA and sobered up, I realized that my father was a dry alcoholic. His behavior was alcoholic. The fact that he would suddenly knock a hole in a wall to make a hatchway was a wonderful idea. But then he would leave everything for my mother to come and clean up. He would never have discussed that with her beforehand. And a lot of the traits of my father, not the anger, but a lot of the traits of my father of being impulsive and doing things, um, I, I carried with me. I carried with me into my life. And my father was extremely strict. We had very, very, very harsh punishments, um, not, not physical punishments, but other punishments. And unfortunately, I also carried those into my life and into my adult life and into my children's life. And my children had hell. My children not only had hell because I was so strict, but also because they had two drinking adult alcoholic parents. And all, of, all three of them I have harmed beyond, beyond words, actually. And I know I can't undo any of that. I was very, very fortunate after I'd been sober for about three years to go to adult children in South Africa. At that stage, there were not very many groups. But I learned there to look at my parents in a completely different way. I learned to look at them and their lives and their backgrounds. And both my mother and my father had totally dysfunctional and very, very difficult and unhappy childhoods. So they brought that into the home. They didn't know how to parent. I went into my home and my married life. I didn't know how to be a wife and I didn't know how to be a parent. I don't remember ever seeing any form of affection between my mother and father. I don't remember my mother hugging me or kissing me or telling me that she loved me or telling me that I look nice or anything. I, I don't remember any of that. I do remember saying to my mother, was it before she died, probably about 20, 25 years ago, um, you know, mom, I think that all the criticism I got as a child did me a tremendous amount of harm. And her reply was, oh, don't you think you deserved it, dear? And I thought, well, actually, I can't talk to this woman. I've tried it, I've, I've tried it over and over again. I could not talk to my mother. But my mother had told my sister, that she would never, ever put her children first, ever. Her husband would always come first before the children. So I would have been able to view my mother in a different light and understand her better. Um, but she, she, she definitely stuck to that. But one of the things that came out of my childhood was tremendous freedom, tremendous confidence in going out.
Okay, I think we've lost the speaker. Let me just, um, sorry guys, see if she'll come back in. I was in, I don't know where I was in my story at all. I have no idea, but I think I was still in my childhood and my parents and. It was freedom, so the freedom that you had in your childhood, that's the last bit you got to. From very young, we were given money on a Sunday afternoon to like get on a bus and go up to Bromley. And I think that was probably because my parents wanted to have quiet sex together. Um, but my sister and I, we loved getting on the bus and going up to Bromley. And I mean, one day I fell into a fountain at a park. You know those fountains that where the first layer is not quite high off the ground? It doesn't have a bottom pool. The bottom sex is like quite high. So as a little girl, I was leaning on it and I toppled over with my face in it. And luckily somebody pulled me out. Because I mean, there was no parental control there at all. But that sense of freedom have been with, has been with me my whole life. And I've done the most amazing, amazing traveling through that freedom that they gave me. And none of these things that I'm telling you now made me an alcoholic. The alcoholic, the reason why I'm an alcoholic is because I have the disease, the terrible, terrible disease of alcoholism. And even though I now have no desire to drink whatsoever, and my spiritual, uh, what can I say, my spiritual malady is gone, and I am spiritually uh, I, okay and improving, because we are not saints, um, I still have a lot of, I still have a lot of, I can, there's a, I've got a lot of character traits that have got to be removed, definitely as I'm now discovering all these things about me and about myself. I never wanted to drink. We used to have wine on the Sunday, a small glass, I can't say it was well or it did anything, I didn't want to drink. And my boyfriend, who then became my husband, he had been drinking for a number of years, probably, I think, since he was about 16. So he really wanted me to drink. And one day he said to me, he said to me I have got the most perfect drink for you. You are going to love this. They're just the drink for you. And it was called the Ginger Square. And it was brandy, I think, ginger brandy and ginger ale sweet and absolutely delicious and I remember the first night I had that the next morning I was discussing with a friend of mine ginger square sauce night from somebody who didn't drink normal drinkers do never count their drinks they don't discuss it the next morning they might might say oh I've got a bit of a, a headache I've had an, I think I had too much wine but not oh, they don't know exactly how many drinks they had so that should have been my first um, inclination that there was something wrong, but I went a long way from there. That was the drink I was told that the prostitutes drank. So I didn't become a prostitute, but eventually I did become a slut. And we will get there eventually. So con arriving from South arriving from England to South Africa, went to a school, Mowbray Junior School, very rough. Very, very rough. I used to physically fight in the playground. Then went to a convent um, where we were, we, we were taught to be like the Virgin Mary. And we were taught that we were, we must, we must model ourselves as the Virgin Mary and we must be on a pedestal. And I rather liked that. There was a lot of things I didn't like about the Catholic Church, which wasn't the things that I did like, was that I was now... <laughs> like, like virginal and on this pedestal and that I was like this wonderful sort of beautiful lady um well the lady eventually went out the window and uh the drinking got heavier and you all know I don't have to tell you where it took me because it took me into terrible 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 places and I was a high functioning alcoholic my children always had food I paid bills. I didn't stop answering my uh, opening letters. I go way back. So we still had letters in those days. We didn't have computers or anything like that or television. Television, of course, came very late to South Africa. 
So we were way behind the time with, with that as well. Um, but the drinking progressed and I went to Namibia. My husband went to prison. And when he came out, I said to him, if he wanted to stay married to me, he had to go with me to Vintu. But I, in the meantime, had got his power of attorney and sold the car. He said, like, what are we going to do in Vintu? I said, well, we'll catch buses and trains like everybody else. Not knowing there were no buses and no trains, that they had the highest number of cars per capita in the world. There was a bus that ran twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And you couldn't have a hangover and not get up in the morning because I had a child to take to crash. The bus would stop and you would get up and you would take your child to crash. And in the afternoon, the bus would stop and you'd pick up the child, get back on the same bus and go home. So that was all an experience. But the Vintuk people were heavy, heavy, heavy drinking. Wow. I always remember my husband saying that he never drank at lunchtime. You know, well, at least I never drink at lunchtime. I didn't drink every day in the beginning either. But I do remember a time where I did not cook dinner for six months sober. There were always people in the house. There was always booze going on. So I went from somebody who didn't want to drink to somebody who got drunk every day. I didn't become a 24 drunk, 24 hour drunk. And for that, I am so grateful. How that happened, I do not know. I'm not going to get finished if I don't skip forward a bit. So, AA, not 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 understanding anything. Not I thought that the, I thought that the people, I thought the men, the men were so miserable that they might as well go out and drink. It was so childish. I mean, they, did these people really think that I was like eight years old? Think, think, think. Keep it simple. Easy does it. What was that? What did that mean? I had no idea. And I didn't want to know particularly. But I desperately wanted to get sober. That I wanted. I wanted to stop drinking. One day, I'm not going to make this a long story, but one day, uh, oh, yes, sponsorship. Somebody who had two days sobriety and myself, with one day of sobriety, decided we would co-sponsor each other. We knew nothing. She died sober, and I am still sober. So whatever we did worked, even though it was frowned upon, we did something that was good. I can't remember how many weeks sober I was, or months, or whatever, but we went to rescue somebody who, who we were told had gone to a pub. And she said she would only come out of the pub if we had alcohol. And I said, I've got a bottle of wine at home. So we took her back to my house, opened the bottle of wine. She decided she didn't want any. I took her long, I mean, long, I'm talking about long distances we were driving, like 30 kilometers that way, 30 kilometers that way, 50 kilometers that way. And I got back home and there was an open bottle of wine. I mean, like, really? What could I do with that? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean you know, open, cork is gone. So I drank it. I didn't drink again for quite a while. And then I was at a meeting um, and I was driving home from the meeting and I thought, I've got whiskey at home. That would be really, really rather nice. So I had some whiskey. And that became a habit. I went to a meeting on a Tuesday, a meeting on a Wednesday, a meeting on a Saturday, a meeting on a Sunday. So I didn't drink on the nights before the meetings. So I could drink on a Friday night and I could drink on a Thursday night. And I never told anybody. I never stopped going to the meetings and I never told a soul. And I was doing a lot of service. And I did not feel guilty one little bit. I was still so arrogant and so self-centered and so full of myself and so bloody fucking clever that I didn't have to ask anybody for help. I didn't have to say, I don't know what the program is. I haven't got the program of recovery. I don't know what it is because I was just too clever. And when I eventually admitted that I was still drinking, I probably didn't say still drinking. I said, probably said I'd relapse. I don't, we didn't use the word relapse then. We slipped. 
That's right. And then they used to say, what step have you slipped off? We slipped in those days. But I had slipped and um, they said, well, are you, are you okay now? Yes, I'm okay. But I mean, I had only got to like 24 hours of sobriety. So somebody else said to me, your name is not in the, in the birthday book. Why not? And I said, well, because it isn't. And she said, when did you have your last drink? I said, I don't know. She said, everybody knows when they had their last drink. When did you have your last drink? I said, on Wednesday. She said, write it in the book. And that is the last drink you ever have. And it was. At seven years of sobriety, strong sobriety at that stage, I went to a little town in the middle of nowhere with no meetings, which I've told you about. I was in India. I hadn't looked to go to a meeting. I had vaguely looked, vaguely looked, and I did have. I had my daily got my daily uh, reflections with me, and which I was reading every day. But I decided I would like to go to a meeting to celebrate my twenty fifth anniversary, and I went to this convention, and I got such a shock because everybody there did the most incredible amount of work to stay sober to help others, to, to be better people. And I thought, how did I get here? How did I get to 25 years of sobriety? Hanging on a shoestring, how did I do this? And when I got back to Cape Town, I spoke to a friend and she said, what literature do you have? And I said, nothing. She said, what do you read every day? And I said, nothing. She said, I will send you literature every day. And I have had literature from her every single day for almost seven years. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. The person who told me in my first year, take the cotton wool out of your ears and shove it in your mouth and sit down and listen, saved my life. And I'm very grateful to her. Her name is Maylene, and the person who sends me the literature is Sue, and I'm so grateful to both of them. And I'm not sure whether you've heard enough. Nobody's telling me anything. I don't even know what the time is. What is the time? Uh, what is the time? Uh, ten minutes. Okay, okay, super. For those of you who are new or nearly new, Life happens. It doesn't matter how long you've been sober, five months or five years. It's only one day. And life happens. And Mr. Alcoholism, the ism, is sitting on your shoulder and waiting. And I am only one arm's length away from a drink. That is all I have. I have today. And when life happened, especially when I had no contact with AA and no sponsor, I dealt with it and I must tell you that some of the most incredible things happened to me in this little town. I, my dog was poisoned so they could steal my car. My car being stolen was a wonderful lesson because I was busy renovating a house. I couldn't jump in my, and where I lived, you couldn't, you could go to three hardware stores and still not get a whole gutter with the ends and the brackets and the holes and the joints, you could, they weren't available. So it was frustrating. And had I had a car, I would have jumped in my car and driven a hundred kilometers. I learned patience. I learned not to judge when I was there. It was the biggest AA in a meeting waiting to happen. And I, they were my friends and I had learned not to be judgmental and a lot of extremely good lessons. But for those of you who are new, life happens. And we just come to meetings and it gets better and better and better every single day. And for that, I'm going to say thank you so much for listening to me with such patience. And I'm sorry that I have been jumping backwards and forwards. And, you know, I don't know whether this is the talk that I was going to give or this, what I was going to share, but I hope that it was guided. And I hope if one person gets one thing out of what I've said tonight, I will be happy. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.